This morning, as was mentioned, we will focus on the Word of God as found in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 8. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, when Christians live through troubled times, as is the case for most Christians throughout the centuries, they sometimes comfort themselves by saying things like, we don't know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. Uh, maybe you've used that saying yourself. To comfort yourself or to comfort your loved ones or members of the body of Christ. And there's a lot of comfort in that saying. We don't know the details of tomorrow or next week or next year, and we, we don't even know the details of the fullness of the kingdom of God. But I would say that that saying is not the full truth of the Bible. Maybe it's better to say we know him who holds the future. Indeed, we know him, Jesus Christ. And we also know the future because the one who holds the future has revealed the future to us. And he has done so in a very special way in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. He has told us what is to come. He has told us about the, the hope that ought to be dominating our hearts and minds and driving our behavior. And that's one of the things that I will stress throughout this sermon, that the hope that we have in our hearts, to the degree that it truly captures our hearts, will be the great driver of our behavior and of our lifestyle, of our conduct. So Revelation 21 and 22 are about the future. The vision communicated here is powerful. It's a very powerful vision. It's also a very beautiful vision. And I think it's important that we become intimately familiar with this vision, which by no accident is at the last part of the Bible. And so today and in the weeks to come, we will dwell on this vision for a while. And the hope is that this vision of the future will act like a magnet on our hearts, that it will attract us and pull us toward that future in faith. So what then is the future toward which believers are moving? The first thing that John says about this future is that it involves the arrival of a new heaven and a new earth. And the word new plays a big role here in verses 1 through 4. There's a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem. So the sun will be new, the moon will be new, the mountains will be new, the forest fields and pastures will be new, all the living creatures will be new, human beings will be new. The very ground in which we walk will be new. Everything will be new. Also cosmically considered in terms of our solar system and the galaxy in which we live and, and all the vast galaxies of our universe. All of this says John in his vision will become a new heaven and a new earth. Now, it's important to understand that the word new doesn't always mean in the Bible completely new or brand new, absolutely new. Let me give you an analogy here. If you have a house built for yourself, then you can say, this is indeed a new house. It wasn't there before and now it is here. It is a new house. But if you buy an older house and then um, decide to do ma major renovations to that house, you could also conceivably describe it as a new house. I saw the house in which I lived yesterday. I saw it for a while, in which I lived when I was a boy between the ages of four and 11 or so. And it was the same house, but it was also very appreciably different to the point that it could even be called a new house. Or what do you call a house when it has a new roof, when it has new windows, when it has new wiring, when it has new plumbing and new siding and a new deck and a new fence? Uh, virtually everything about that house is new, a new kitchen, new cabinets, new paint, new carpet, new lino. Then you have, for all intents and purposes, a new house. And you might even describe it that way in your conversation with people. Although it is not a brand new house, it is a totally renovated new house. And so when the Bible uses the word new in new heaven and new earth, 
we are to think of it in that sense of completely renewed, renovated, sparkling with new glory that it never had before. Now, how do we know that the means new in this latter sense? Well, we know that from a variety of angles. We know that, for instance, from chapter 8 of Romans, where the Apostle Paul says that our present creation is in, is in agony. Paul says that creation today is groaning in travail. It's groaning because of the curse of God which lays upon it due to human sin. And what's the future according to Paul in Romans 8? The future is not for the world to be annihilated and for God to create a brand new universe. Instead, says Paul, this present creation will be set free from its bondage to decay and death, and it will be made new. That's one text that you can think of. You can think of what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This earth, this world which God created in the beginning will be the inheritance of the meek. And the meek means those who put their trust in the Lord and not in human pride. A third angle to consider is the analogy with our resurrection bodies. <clears throat> the Bible has promised that this body which we now possess will be transformed on the day of Christ, or if we die before that, our bodies will be resurrected, and they will be completely new, and yet they will be recognizably ourselves, just like Jesus was recognizably Jesus. He rose from the dead. It was the same Jesus who died and who rose and he ascended into heaven. It's the same Jesus in heaven today at the right hand of God. The same Jesus who was born of Mary is today in heaven at the right hand of God. So there's a continuity of Jesus through death and resurrection. And that same continuity will be uh, for all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We will receive a new body but it will be a renewed body. It will be us transformed and glorified and wondrously renovated, you might say. A resurrection upgrade was an expression we used some time ago in a sermon. And so just like our bodies will receive a resurrection upgrade, so this entire world in which we live will be transformed and glorified in ways that we can hardly imagine. An analogy came to mind also as I was thinking about the sermon this morning. I remember living on the prairies in the winter time. The world looks dead. Like here, the world never looks totally dead. It's still green in the dead of winter. But on the prairies, it's really dead. Everything is sterile, either white or, or brown. In the case of Calgary, usually it's brown. It's brown, and then it gets muddy, and you don't see any sign of life, and it's not very pretty. But then... Late April, early May, the magic happens. And pretty soon, you're living in a brand new world full of color, and sound, and vitality that was absent just a few weeks ago. It's the same world, but a totally transformed world. And I believe Revelation 21 verse 1 is talking about something like that. A spring-like transformation of heaven and earth so that it's the same world, but made new. There's also a theological reason for believing this. It's not just various texts and so on, but also a theological reason. The Bible says that God so loves the world. And if God so loves the world, does it stand to reason that God is just going to absolutely give up on his old creation and, and, and concede that, that the powers of evil have been victorious in that old, crea in that old creation and, and therefore God has to obliterate the old and start out with something entirely brand new like he did in Genesis 1 verse 1. That would be conceding a victory to the evil one. And so Reformed theologians throughout the ages have, have consistently confessed that the newness of Revelation 21 is not brand newness but is the newness of renewal, the newness of transformation and renovation. At the end of verse 1, there's a detail that uh, can trouble us. It says at the end of verse 1, the sea was no more. And if you love the ocean, that's very troubling. 
maybe you have a boat and you like to go out into um, Howe Sound once in a while and maybe go fishing out in Juan de Fuca Strait and you see beautiful things in the ocean, whales and dolphins and fish, maybe you're a scuba diver and you go into the reefs and you see extraordinary beauty lying below the surface and then you read this and you say, oh, that's a downer. The sea was no more. How can the new creation be perfect if the sea is obliterated? How can it be perfect if there are no whales and dolphins? Well, I would say, dear brothers and sisters, not to worry about that because this part of verse 1 is not meant to be taken literally. In the Bible, uh, the, the raging storms of the sea and the floods that oceans can inflict upon people and society are symbols of sinful rebellion against God. And we caught just a taste of that in Psalm 93 when we sang it this morning. But there are many psalms that contain this kind of imagery. It says in verse 2, stanza 2 of the rhyme version, that to you the seas have lifted up their voice. And verse 3, but mighty though the thundering floods may be, more mighty than the breakers of the sea is he the Lord. You can go through many of the psalms where the floods and the storms of the sea are symbolic of creation at war with God. Because you see in the beginning, God put all the seas in the right place and he established boundaries. And when there's a flood, it's like creation is rebelling against God. And so the psalmist took it as a symbol of the endless chaos of humanity striving against God. And so when the sea is no more, that's the poet's way of saying that's the end of the rebellion. That's the end of this chaos of striving against the Lord. And so don't worry. If you love dolphins, uh, they'll be there. And if you love blue whales, they'll be there. And there'll probably be a lot more sockeye than there are left in the Fraser River today. And so beautiful things of the first creation will be there also in the renewed creation, and they will be there in abundance and glory. As we come to verse 2, we come to the heart of um, the vision of what is our future. John says, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. New Jerusalem, the holy city, it's new. It's called Jerusalem in, in line with the Old Testament because in the Old Testament dispensation, God had made Jerusalem his dwelling place. Jerusalem was a place you had to go if you were a believer in the Old Covenant. If you wanted to meet God and to have communion with him, you had to go to Jerusalem and you had to go to the temple where the Lord had made his name to dwell, where the Lord had established the glory of his presence. And so that was where you could have the ultimate communion with God. It was in his house in Jerusalem. And sometimes the Old Testament speaks of the whole city of Jerusalem as God's dwelling place. And in the, in the prophets, the expression holy city always refers to that, that ancient city in the Middle East, which we call Jerusalem. But the psalmists and the prophets were always aware, brothers and sisters, that that earthly Jerusalem was not God's ultimate plan. It wasn't the ultimate goal of his redemption to just have a city there in the Middle East where people could go and have fellowship with him. God always had something greater in mind, something more glorious. And what that more glorious reality is, is revealed to us here in Revelation 21, verse 2. This is the Jerusalem not of time, but the Jerusalem of eternity. This is Jerusalem not of a specific place in the Middle East, but it's a, it's a global Jerusalem. The city congregation of Jesus Christ is an image of the church. This is an image of the perfected church of God, the church of all times and places, the church of all the saints from, from the time of Adam and Eve to the, the gathering in of the last believer. It's a picture of all of those saints of God living with God in the fullness of relational communion living with God in relational communion forever. That is the picture 
at the heart of the new Jerusalem. And I wonder if that excites us. I wonder if it excites us to think that our future is defined primarily by this amazing reality of just being with God. You know, if you love somebody, isn't that what you desire above all? If you're a young person and you're in love, what, what do you want to do the most? You just want to be with the person you love. You've been married 25 years. Hopefully you still have that same feeling. You just want to be with the person you love. Maybe you have a really good friend and she lives in Montreal and you can't wait to be with her again because that's awesome when you're together and that's the, the, the be all and end all of life when you can just enjoy your friendship. And that's a kind of expectation that Christians ought to have about the future, that the future is above all this astounding gift of God bestowing his presence upon us. We get to be with God. That's awesome. And God says it's going to be glorious. It's going to be a togetherness such as you've never experienced before. And it's not going to have to end. This will not be a visit with an end to it. It's not that you go to the temple and then you go home again. No, this is going to be an ongoing, eternal communion with your maker, your God, your redeemer. A couple of features of this holy city stand out for us. First of all, it's holy. The new Jerusalem is unlike the old Jerusalem. The old Jerusalem was never really holy because there were sinful people there all the time, infecting the place with their wickedness. But the new Jerusalem says John will be a holy city. There won't be any sin in it. There won't be any violations of God's commandments going on in that place. Imagine the contrast, like even right now, if we, could, if we could sum up all the violations of God's commandments that are going on even now, it would be probably quite a long list. But when you're in the New Jerusalem, there won't be a single violation of any commandment of God occurring at any moment of the day or night. But the entire place will be saturated with a spirit of complete submission, joyful surrender, glad embrace of the commandments of the holy God of the holy city. The second thing that strikes us about the holy city in verse 2 is that it comes down out of heaven from God. So this is not in any way human creation. Sometimes we get grandiose ideas about our place and God's redemption. But, you know, the, the building of the church, that is God's work 100%. As we read in the, in the letter to the Hebrews, the builder and the architect of the heavenly Jerusalem is God. So the church is a 100% divine creation, and God calls us into service in the church, but it is his work. And so here we are this morning. We are the work of God, and one day that work of God will be perfected. So that puts us in our place keeps us humble. Human beings always dream about a glorious future and they imagine it will come through human planning and human intelligence and human technology. And God says, no, no, it, it comes from me. And it doesn't come from below upwards. It comes from above. It comes from heaven downward to the earth. It's my Jerusalem. It's my holy city. I'm the builder of it. In the second half of uh, verse to John appears to change his images because he was talking about a city and all of a sudden he's talking about a bride adorned for her husband. Is he mixing his metaphors here, so to speak? Not necessarily because we speak about cities also in two ways. Sometimes we speak about a city in terms of its architecture, the sum total of its buildings and churches and streets and parks and so forth. But sometimes we speak about a city also in terms of its people. So if you say the city of Vancouver, you might be talking about the people or, or about the physical entity that's called Vancouver. And John does blur, blend here from speaking of the New Jerusalem as a physical entity to speaking of it as people. And he speaks of that new holy city as a bride adorned for her husband. It's nothing new if you're a Bible reader. It's one of the most familiar images in the Bible. The image of, of God and his people relating to each other in covenant. 
And frequently that covenant is, is described as a marital covenant. So if you want to know what's at the heart of the universe, it's this marital covenant between God and his church, Jesus and his church. That loving communion between God and his people, that is the defining thing about the universe. And it's the defining thing about the New Jerusalem. That's where that marital relationship between God and his people, that eternal covenant, comes into its full glory. John says that the bride is adorned for her husband. And we all know what that's like. We've seen brides walking down the aisle in their bridal glory. And this bride is also gloriously beautiful. But there's one difference here. This bride is beautiful because the bridegroom has made her beautiful. And that's not how it usually works in human marriages. But this bride is beautiful because the bridegroom has shed his blood for her and he has sanctified her with his word and spirit. And if you read Ephesians 5, the apostle makes that abundantly clear. He talks there about Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride, and how Jesus has washed his bride in the washing of water with the word. And Ephesians 5 says that, therefore the church is without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but is rather holy and without blemish. So Jerusalem is a holy city, and Jerusalem is a pure bride, not in herself, but by the gracious work of God in Jesus Christ, who has made her holy. And can you imagine the delight that God gets in making you holy and making the bride of his son Jesus Christ beautiful? God gets divine delight in making his church beautiful. When we come to verse 3, we see what the holy city is really all about. The most important thing to know about the holy city is this. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. So once again, that is the heart of it all. This is what the future is for you who believe. The future is for you to enjoy with your God a perfect fellowship. And, and this is Old Testament language. The law and the prophets speak frequently about God dwelling with his people. That's the heart of the covenant. The Lord dwells with us. He lives with us. He comes and establishes his campsite with us, you might say, to use the, the word tabernacle. Tabernacle is a tent. And so God came and put his tent down among the tents of his people. And that's really the future God tenting with you, God tabernacling with you, God, your Savior, Jesus Christ, desire to dwell with you. What could be more fulfilling, more exalting than the Lord dwelling with you? Verse 22 of this chapter, uh, it's not in our text, but I just want to draw your attention to it briefly. Verse 22 says, I saw no temple in this city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. The whole city will be filled with the glory of God, just like the temple was filled with the glory of God. Do you remember what happened when Solomon's temple was dedicated? You can read about this in 1 Kings chapter 8. So Solomon had a long dedicatory prayer, very lengthy prayer. Pray for all the needs of the church and all the needs of the world. And he thanked God for his dwelling place. And then the glory of God came in. And the glory of God, congregation, who can fulfill the longings of your heart. Now, in our present lives, we cannot know the fullness of God's presence. But I, I want to say a word here at this point about the continuity of the present and the future. Because what Revelation 21 is talking about is not completely only the future. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 12 about our public worship services. So Hebrews 12 is given a description of what happens every time you as Christians gather to worship the Lord. It says, Hebrews 12, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Every time you worship with faith, you are drawing near in the spirit to the heavenly Jerusalem, and you are getting a genuine foretaste of that fullness 
of God's presence and glory that is promised to you in Revelation 21. So I want to stress that. Already now, you today are drawing near by faith to the heavenly Jerusalem. But of course, we don't live there yet. We still live here. And if truth be told, if truth be told, and we should tell the truth, shouldn't we, about our Christian walk, we shouldn't pretend. If truth be told, in our Christian walk, we don't always feel the presence of the Lord very deeply. Sometimes, I'm pretty sure you will say, I don't feel God at all. He feels very far away from me right now. I hardly sense his presence. And if that's the way you, you feel, that's sad. This can be very devastating, but it doesn't mean you're not a child of God. Because when you go through the Psalms, that's one of the things the psalmist says frequently. Lord, where are you? When are you going to show yourself? When will you come? When will you make yourself real to me again? When will I feel you in the, in the power of your presence in my heart? But in the holy city, you'll never have that feeling again. You'll never have to say again, Lord, I don't feel you. Where are you? Make yourself known to me because you will be feeling the fullness of God 24-7 as the saying goes. Every single moment of the day, you will be started. So John's on the island of Patmos when he receives his 